Hello, and welcome to Trek in Time, the podcast that takes a look at Star Trek in order and in history. What I mean by that is that we're going to talk about each episode of Star Trek in chronological order, and we're also going to take a look at how things were in the world when the episode originally aired. We're going to take a deeper dive into the episodes as well and the eras in which they were broadcast. And you're probably wondering who is doing all this trekking. Well, it's going to be me. I'm Sean Farrell. I'm a writer, including some sci-fi books. And with me is my brother. He's a tech guru, and he has the YouTube channel Undecided with Matt Farrell, which takes a look at emerging tech and its impact on our lives. Matt, do you want to say hi? Hello, everybody. Today, we're going to be talking about the fourth episode of the show Enterprise. This episode is Strange New World. It aired on October 10th, 2001, and was viewed by 7.8 million people. At this point in Enterprise's viewership, they still had a solid audience. If you take a look over the next few episodes, you can see that it declines a little bit week by week. This was, of course, on the fledgling UPN network, and it was struggling a bit to get people to actually remember that it existed. Yep. Early on in UPN's days, they had national broadcasts on, I think it was four nights a week, something like that. The rest of it was local syndication, which made for some confusion yeah. in whether or not it was actually a network. But what was the world like when this episode landed for the now third week in a row? Alicia Keys' Fallen was still the number one song. <laughs> yep. She's still and fallen, Sean. She's still fallen. She still hasn't landed. Yep. The number one movie at the time of the airing of this was finally an episode. Movie uh, I a movie I actually know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no more uh, through the looking glass at alternate realities where movies that we didn't know exist were <laughs> were being viewed. This movie was Training Day. Training Day is, of course, the 2001 American crime thriller directed by Antoine Fuqua and written by David Ayer. It stars Denzel Washington as Alonzo Harris and Ethan Hawke as Jake Hoyt, two LAPD narcotics officers over a 24-hour period in the gang-ridden neighborhood of Westlake, Echo Park, and South Central Los Angeles. This is a movie that ended up winning Washington an Oscar, and yep. Hawk was also nominated. And it is a, still to this day, extremely solid movie. Yeah, it's excellent. Holds up well. Yeah. And some of the competition for Enterprise at this time being broadcast included, of course, Matt's favorite show, According to Jim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know how many episodes mm. i've seen sean <laughs> i i None. think you've uh, managed to miss all of them <laughs> i've missed every single episode of that show yeah according to jim is of course the american sitcom television series starring jim belushi in the title role as a suburban father of three children and then five children starting with the seventh season finale so guess Seven what show years. suffered from the uh-oh our viewership is flagging let's introduce some babies Yes. Because you know what helps a sitcom, Matt? Nothing better than adding new characters nobody cares about. Right. Especially or or literally jumping a shark. Yes. <laughs> this show was an ABC sitcom. And here's the kicker that I was not expecting. It aired for eight years. That's insane. October of 2001 to June of 2009. This is one of those programs that I could have sworn was canceled after seven episodes. It. Yes. <laughs> who watches course, that? <laughs> who is watching this? Uh, and of course, I still suffer from that because I just recently discovered that Grey's Anatomy is still on television. And I was just like, didn't yes. it cancel like 10 years ago? No. no it's going to go on not. forever, Sean. It's going to go on forever. Yeah, it's Grey's Anatomy's world. We just live in it. Also, from the day that this episode aired... The New York Times headline, and this is a continuation of the big story of the of each of our previous episodes, what was going on in the world when Enterprise began, 
the ramifications of September 11th were what was going on. And the New York Times headline is the U.S. said to plan copter raids in Afghanistan. Hmm. And some other of the headlines on the same front page included expressing George W. Bush's upset at leaks and having to fight with Congress over actions he was trying to take. This is the world we were living in at the time was just starting to come into focus at this point. I, I remember that it was almost a month after September 11th and it was starting to feel like, okay, we can have our feet back underneath us and we are recognizing how drastically things are going to change. And everybody at that point in the U S knew there would be a war. Mm -hmm. We just didn't know with whom. And the beginnings were right here with the copter raids going into Afghanistan and the preparation for full fledged invasion. But on now to the episode itself, enterprise, of course, a very different tone than what was going on in the world around it at the time. Cause it was written at a different time <laughs> because it was written. Yes, <laughs> yes. In a much different era of only a few months to a year earlier. Exactly. Um, Matt, do you want to read the synopsis for us? Sure. Enterprise encounters a new world much like Earth. A small crew stays on the surface overnight to continue researching the planet, and a violent storm forces the crew to shelter into a local cave, but crew members believe they are not alone. Mm. Dun, dun, dun. Strange new world indeed. Yes. So starting with the beginning of the episode, the plot unfolds as the Enterprise passes a previously unknown Minshara-class planet. And of course, a Minshara-class planet is an M class planet. And I love that. Yeah. It turns out that, that little touch. Yeah. So a little nice. touch. Uh, this was the first reveal of what M class meant stands for. Yeah. In the Star Trek, in the Star Trek universe. I love that. Back to being Vulcans. a Vulcan word. Yeah, yeah. It's picking up a Vulcan terminology for a planet that can sustain humanoid life. So they find this Minshara class planet and Captain Archer orders a shuttle to be prepared for an away mission. Now, the way we're handling the podcast is I'm reading the plot synopsis as provided on Wikipedia, and Matt and I will jump in with comments wherever we want to, and we're not even out of the opening teaser. <laughs> before we're going to stop. <laughs> before we're, we're going to stop, this. because yeah. I got some major issues Me too. right at the beginning Me too. the approach that... Yes. And this is, I have, I have parallel complaints. You can have bad writing mm -hmm. and you can have bad character choices. Mm -hmm. The two are not mutually exclusive, but if you're going to have bad character choices, you really need to have good writing. Yes. This for me was a combination of both of both. Yeah. Me too. The one strong point in the writing in the teaser is that to Paul keeps saying, you shouldn't go down to that planet. Yeah. <clears throat> Her argument from the very beginning is a Vulcan ship would send down unmanned probes, study the planet for maybe a week before sending individuals down to take a look at it. Mm -hmm. The humans on board led by captain Archer led by the captain. Let's go. <laughs> no, 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 no. We want to go down there. We, we came out here to see stuff. We're going to go see stuff. Everybody get in the car. We're going out yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Immediately, I was reminded, Matt, of uh, the ice storm that hit Western New York. <laughs> yes. What did our in parents do? January yes. of 1991. Yes. And power was down for 75% of the area. The, this is gone. the area. Power lines were down everywhere uh there's half an inch of I, ice hanging on everything it yes was the, the the roads were bad. treacherous the 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 word was out do not leave your homes stay at home people had no power for some people had no power for months some just people just had going no electricity for months it was a devastating event it took trees down across the region and the trees were taking power lines down and the word was stay off the roads. Emergency vehicles need to get through here. And this is fire crews, ambulances, police, and emergency uh, electrical repair had to be done. 
And this what does our parents do? What does our parents our do? Parents grab the VCR, the, the, the video camera. And I was at school. I was at college. No, they, but they grabbed the camera. They grabbed Matt. They hopped in the family car. And they're like, let's drove, go. <laughs> drove around the city. And, and we tried to eat, get some lunch. That was my favorite mm. part. We stopped at a restaurant to get some lunch. And I think it was dad went inside and came back out and said, they have no power. They're not serving anything. All they're doing is making cold sandwiches. And my mom and mom just went, oh, geez. And they got yeah. in the car. And we drove away. Like, what did you expect? <laughs> the entire city is shut down. This right. is an emergency. Uh, our so parents. effectively, Captain Archer is our parents. Yes. He pushes to go down to the planet without knowing what to expect. And to me, that is on its own was a bad character choice. But the way it was written was so cavalier. He was reckless. Just completely It reckless. was being depicted as if he was on the right side. Mm-hmm. That, that to Paul, the Vulcan was a stick in the mud. And they didn't miss an opportunity of the first 20 minutes of the episode to mock to Paul. And but in, in defense of that, though, though, by the end of the episode, it's clear that they were doing that to basically give the humans their comeuppance. And by the end, she was the one that was right. But I agree with you. It was so sloppy. And on top of which, it's like as he's doing that, they're on the ship and he's saying, we're going to go. My first thought was, at this point, humans, they're not stupid. We know about contaminants and contagions, and we know yes. this is an alien planet. And in, in the very first episode, we had the gel shower scene where they established they were trying to decontaminate themselves before yes. they came back on the ship for fear of, you know, contagion. And it's like, right. and here they are just recklessly re- about to go down to an alien planet they've never been on before. And they don't know what's down there. And it was like, wait, just... Like yeah. a few episodes earlier, you guys were being very cautious about this. They go down to the planet with such speed that if there had been an open window that they could have <laughs> jumped out, out to get down to the planet, they would have gone <laughs> through that open window. Yes. And I will disagree with you on one point. I think in the big picture, the story structure is there that says yeah. the humans get their comeuppance. However, I will nitpick in one way. Okay. There is never a moment of dialogue at the end of the episode in which any human says, hmm, maybe we were too rash. Exactly. Yes. It needed to at least have that to have the kind of full circle that you're talking about. It didn't have that. As a result, to Paul is quietly right. But the show never makes a point of telling the audience, hey, did you notice that to Paul was right? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm and we're really going to try and get through this plot summary. I promise you, we are trying to do that. But the writing at the beginning of this episode was so problematic for me that here we go with the next line, which is, after an afternoon studying the planet, Subcommander T'Pol, Commander Tucker, and Ensign Mayweather will request further time on the planet and do so with Archer's approval. Okay, I'm putting pause on the synopsis again to point out this. Previous episodes, T'Pol has made the point, and Archer has made the point, that when you do an away mission, you take the personnel that makes sense. In this episode, Archer gives that uh, ability to make up the away team to Commander T'Pol. Subcommander T'Pol has put together a away team that includes the pilot of the ship and the chief engineer. She what was reluctant possible on that, roles though. would she they was, have on an away team? She was reluctant on that, though. She was reluctant about keeping them there them? overnight. No, no, keeping them I'm not talking night. about the keeping them over the night. Just bring them there in the first place. Bringing them there in the first place. Right. Previous episode, it had Tucker arguing with Archer saying, I want to go on this alien ship we just found because (laughs) I'm here for adventure as much as for being the engineer of the ship. And Archer made the point rightfully so to say as chief engineer, your job is on the ship. You need to be here first and foremost, his inclusion by the Vulcan who's putting together a team that makes sense. Logically, she's taking along a chief engineer to a planet that has no technology on it. It makes zero cents. There are also two other crewmen, and here is one of the uh, bright points 
in the episode. There's Crewman Cutler and there's Crewman Novokovic. And mm-hmm. the two of them are included and even have a small scene at the very beginning of the episode where they are having a meal together. And in classic Star Trek fashion, Star Trek is very, very good at showing characters you've never seen before who are supposed mm-hmm. to be members of a crew and giving a moment which illustrates personality in those people. I think that Star Trek has always uh, had a bright spot in that way. Yeah. And that's on on on. Uh, show here with the two of them having a meal she's trying something that's it turns out she's eating a vulcan dish because she's actually interested in befriending to paul and i thought that that was a very nice character trait um and the two of them have a little back and forth and then their inclusion on the shuttle does something very interesting i think as they are part of the team that is staying overnight i think that their presence gave a very strong element of actual danger and threat. Yeah. Because when you see a group of main characters in any of the Star Trek programs go somewhere, the, the, of course, everybody listening to this, I'm sure is very, very familiar with the red shirt syndrome, which is (laughs) an away team goes anywhere. The person in the red shirt, they're the ones that that are going to die. Yep. And, but that is an element that you have to have because if you don't have a, a, a threat to a character potentially being hurt to the point of death, a lot of the tension gets sucked out of a scene uh, that's supposed to be carrying with it threat. So their inclusion in the UA team makes a lot of sense. Um, so the, the away team uh, is left behind. The captain and Lieutenant Reed return to the Enterprise again uh logic being what it is lieutenant reed is the security officer a security officer leaving the team behind like there's a lot of logical uh gaps here and it's clear that the intent is to get the team onto the planet put them in a position of being effectively lost at sea when things start to turn south I could think of a half dozen quickly off the top of my head, different ways that they could have had that moment. You could have had a shuttle go down and it ends up having some sort of accident. There's a, there's a scene later on where the captain is piloting a rescue pod and because of a storm ends up damaging the craft and he can't land in the winds. You could have had the initial pod coming down to the planet and meet unexpectedly a growing storm that ends up damaging in some way you could have had the crew is left in one area the pod is going to go to a different area and in traveling to that different area the storm kicks up and the pod can't return to them there are a number of different ways that you could have done this without it seeming to be a let's go camping it really bothered me you mentioned before their ability their, their knowledge of contaminants they show up on the planet. The first thing that you see when the pod they <laughs> yes. the pod opens is the captain the has brought his dog with him. <laughs> yeah, when Porthos came running out in that shot, I was like, "Oh, come on!" It's like yeah. you don't know what's down there. You could kill your dog. What are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah. And then there's the the the, the scientist. Uh, what's his name? Uh, the the guy Novokovic. It's like mm-hmm. there's a shot of him picking a alien flower and shoving it against his nose and yeah. taking a deep breath it's like yeah oh nothing could go wrong with that it's like yeah. any scientist would know you probably shouldn't be doing that so it, it well, was, they should be wearing hazmat, hazmat suits, suits. So, I mean, so just yeah I, I will agree with you 100 percent. the setup of this episode is horribly flawed it's really yes. bad it's bad writing bad character choices it's just like i'm gonna yada 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 past it it's like okay yeah fine we're on the planet For, forget all that that crappy storytelling and from this point forward yeah the show takes a very different turn for the better i think i think it definitely yes. gets more enjoyable once they're there i agree with you completely i think if the show had actually started at this plot point yes it would have been a much better starting point and would have given would have given them a lot more room to do what they would do later in the episode and and it could have been a far more effective episode we're at the plot point now where the the away team has been left behind on the planet and they are effectively camping out overnight 
it starts with them in a fireside, fireside chat scene where Meriwether is telling effectively ghost stories. Ghost stories, yeah. And I thought that was a great clue as to where the episode was headed. This element of the dangers in space exploration, the unknown, and mm -hmm. looking at it with a spooky side as opposed to the awe-inspiring side. I thought mm -hmm. that that was a nice touch. And that is something that the show has now done in the previous episode as well. When they find the derelict ship that has, it's effectively a space vampire story where there is a crew that has been killed and is hanging and something is being siphoned from their bodies. And the interior of that alien ship was very spooky and very well done from a almost horror aspect. And that's effectively where this is headed as well. So they are on the planet. It's late in the evening and a violent storm approaches trip suggests that the landing party use a local cave that to discovered earlier for shelter can we, can we pause just for a quick second yeah. though right before that when the storm hits there were there was a scene that i thought was very funny and charming where to in her own little tent and meriwether and um uh, trip are in a different tent sharing a tent and the wind is blowing everything up and trip freaks out because there's this alien scorpion looking bug in his sack and these two grown men are essentially like standing up on the chair in the kitchen screaming like oh my god yes. oh my god oh my god they're freaking out and to paul's just looks and radios over to them going do you have a problem over there because <laughs> they're just completely <laughs> out of their minds i thought that was a very charming like just fun to see these two grown men just having a, a freak out session and the Vulcan having her just like the, the deadpan delivery. It was a very nice little moment and good, good humor. Yeah. So once they're in the cave, Mayweather goes back to the original campsite to recover food and notices three humanoid life forms wandering around in the woods. T'Pol scans at this point have revealed no unusual bio signs in the confines of the cave crewman cutler and novokovic begin seeing and hearing humanoids as well tucker also reports to archer about seeing a mysterious alien life form searching for these life forms to paul takes a phase pistol and walks deeper into the cave at this point novokovic has also separately removed himself from the cave in a paranoid out. fit yeah. and he's <laughs> clearly acting un starfleet at that point um th th all of this at this point this whole sequence you just read through there's a very nice gradual um increase in the what's going on like with these yeah. characters like it, it's clear there's something going on in their heads because they're they're reacting to things that it's like is that thing there or is that thing not there and they're all yes. kind of seeing it's a, it's a spooky ghost story and i thought it was yeah. a very nice gradual amp up of th their anxieties growing slowly mm -hmm. but they're still in control of who they are and then there's uh uh Novakovic, who's the first one that just like flips out and yeah. goes hauling ass out of the cave <laughs> and of course to cut forward to the end of the episode it yeah. is the pollen in the flowers which yes. Novakovic inhaled most deeply that is causing the problem it has an hallucinogenic quality to it that dr flox will find later but the exposure to this thing he was most deeply exposed so he's the one having the biggest and fastest reaction to it while everybody else including to paul is having a more gradual exposure and experience with it and to paul's biology being different she is she begins to exhibit a almost um they compare it to dementia almost mm -hmm. where her exposure creates her inability she no longer has the ability to speak english she reverts to vulcan as the only language that she's able to speak and she clearly is wrestling with controlling her emotions she's snappish at points but she's also uh, exhibiting um you can see that she's sweating and there are moments where she looks like she's wrestling with trying to control herself i really thought the actress jolie blaylock did, did a, a really job. great job with this episode and i really thought the director stood out as having done a, a really good job with this you mentioned their entry into the cave the setup of 
Mayweather having to go back and look for the food, seeing people in the woods. You're seeing a lot of stuff from over the shoulder. You're seeing a lot of stuff from clearly this is his perspective. This is a moment where you're seeing what he's seeing and there are figures in the woods and then back in the cave, shifting shadows. At the beginning of the experience in the cave, the directing choices were very standard shots of mm -hmm. like a three camera shot, basically, of a camera here, a camera here, and a camera there. Angles are understood, and we have a sense of where we as the audience member are in the cave. The exits to the left, deeper in the cave is to the right. And as the episode progresses, I thought it was very well done. The camera position begins to change. Yes. There are begin to be objects put effectively at the center focus so the yes. characters are on alternate sides of a barrier between them where they are in strange angles and what we appear to be focused on are things like a column of rock or yes. a dark shadow in the background and the locations of the camera begin to shift so at certain points i had no idea which way i as the audience member was facing the exit to the left was sometimes to the right and the deeper part of the cave was in the wrong spot. And at it times it even felt as if the viewer, yeah. Yeah. It even felt as if they were perhaps even rearranging the cave. Barriers it felt like that maybe, at times. It felt like it that felt at like times, that at times where yeah. shadows didn't seem consistent. Location of major barriers that they had to walk around. There were big columns, there were giant rocks in the way they had to walk a certain way. But they didn't seem at the end of the episode to be walking in the same way that they did at the beginning. I thought that the director did a really great job of making their paranoia and anxiety grow not only in their performance, but in how it was being filmed. And mm -hmm. I thought that that was really, uh, for a TV show, masterfully done tv yes. shows don't typically work on that level so i i thought that that was really great I agree so there novokovich has removed himself from the cave uh ongoing theme that we're probably gonna be touching on a couple of times damsel in distress seems to be a recurring theme in many of these early episodes of enterprise it's something that Star Trek has wrestled with for years. It probably, you could argue, hasn't been solved until perhaps Discovery. Mm -hmm. um, that women will be viewed as, we need to protect you. So Novokovic removes himself. Mayweather and Tucker quickly say, like, we have to go find him in the storm. You ladies stay here. I really didn't like that, especially from the perspective of Tucker is not in charge. Yes. He just uh, took Paul is subcommander to Paul is in charge. So she should be the one calling the shots about who's doing what. But while they remove themselves to go into the storm, she goes deeper into the cave. And with her is crewman Cutler and crewman Cutler ends up following what she thinks are the sounds of a conversation and finds to Paul deep in the cave, having a conversation with some humanoid life form. So she is also exhibiting the paranoia and the experience of seeing things that are not there. Meanwhile, aboard the ship, Archer and Reed are attempting to reach the landing party in a sh shuttle pod. They cannot do so until the wind dies down. The storm is effectively described as like a a, an 18-hour long hurricane. The center of the storm is above the, the landing party. It's going to take another nine hours for it to pass overhead. Which has one of my favorite moments in the entire episode where they're trying to get down to Novokovich and they're getting close and he's Captain Archer's radioing to him. And he looks up at the shuttle and goes, go to hell. Yeah. <laughs> and then it cuts to Archer and the, and the shuttle being like, wait, what? What did <laughs> like, he just say? What did he just say to me? Yeah. <laughs> it was a great little moment. The Enterprise at this point has used the, uh, they've used the transporter but always with reluctance. Yes. And this episode, I Shows thought, why. did a masterful job of depicting why it's a yeah. concern because when the shuttlecraft cannot land to get to Novokovich, the captain reluctantly gives the order to use the transporter. And when they are beaming Novokovich aboard, he gets trapped in the reemergence sequence and the problem was is the computers detected the debris alien pollen in him but is having trouble separating it from him yep. or reintegrating it with him so what it does is effectively 
materializes Novokovitch, but with the organic life form effectively erupting from his skin around his body. But it was it was also it was also the debris that was around him. So there was like because of right. the wind, he had little leaves and stuff that would be blowing through the air, and he there were like sticks half in his leaves cheeks. and yeah. half sticks coming out of him because they came with him yeah. because the computer couldn't differentiate them, which is like yes. terrifying, terrifying. Yeah. It reminded me of in Galaxy Quest, the use of the transporter on Galaxy Quest when they test it first on the giant pig-like creature and the pig-like creature emerges inside out. Yes. So Novokovich first arrives and looks like he's got this eruption of things coming out of his skin. And it, again, has a good horror aspect to it. It's a TV show. It's not graphic, but it's jarring. Yeah. Because at this point, as Star Trek viewers... We've literally seen decades of people beaming in and out with no difficulties. So yep. you see somebody show up with branches coming out of their skin and it's a little bit like you take a, a breath in and you lean back a little bit. So Dr. Flox works on Novokovich and finds that he's been exposed to troposoline, which is a hallucinogenic, hallucinogenic compound found in the pollen on the planet. Initially, Flox responds to he's going to be okay and then finds out later that Novokovich is actually near death, having been poisoned as a response to as this chemical breaks down, it's releasing something at a subatomic level that is effectively poisoning Novokovich. This was another moment where I thought uh, the writing was missing Missing a logical component that if you're going to have it, like the, Flock says later, like, I didn't see a reason to have to run a subatomic scan. This man has just been beamed aboard and reassembled in a hodgepodge fashion. You would think the doctor at that moment would be like, this guy was barely put together. Maybe I, I should do a subatomic scan. I'm going to disagree. <laughs> <laughs> but here's 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 the next here's the my next comment of like okay I didn't like the initial setup of like he's going to be fine in a few hours dun 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 he's dying I didn't like that and you you can let me know what you think about that in a moment but my next response to it would have been if he is going to make that kind of error mm -hmm. I would have liked for the captain at some point later in the episode to say can you do me a favor so that later crews can learn from our errors. Can you start putting together some protocols so that something like this could be avoided in the future? Mm -hmm. What we're seeing effectively is the emergence of Starfleet as the Earth Space Force. Yes. We're seeing the emergence of Starfleet protocols. There are no protocols at this point. So they go down to a planet that they don't really know is safe. Dr. Flox is doing medical procedures without using all the ones at his disposal because he's using a kind of like almost homespun approach as yes. opposed to, oh, we need to be super duper cautious and follow protocols to the letter to be consistent. And we should be seeing that being, there should be a voice in the show that is giving that reminder to us of oh, all of the stuff you're accustomed to and the other yeah. shows that's being built now. They don't have it. And I would have appreciated that moment from Archer of him saying like, hey, doctor, I need you to start putting together some procedures that other people can follow because the crews that follow us, they shouldn't be remaking these mistakes. Okay, so so I, I agree with that sentiment. but And this is one of the flaws of Enterprise is that they lean too heavily onto the fact that all of the viewers watching Enterprise are already steeped in Star Trek 100%. Yeah. So as somebody who is steeped in Star Trek 100% when the show was first aired and I'm watching this, I'm able to put all those connections together myself. I don't need them to literally say it to me because I get it. I get this right. is it's they're, they're going to be this is oh, this mistake happened because they don't have the protocols yet. Oh, they don't have a you know, all the 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 what what's the what's the ultimate the the prime directive? It's like they don't prime have directive. that yet. They don't have all those kind yeah. of things. So it's like I get it and I can see they're seeding all that stuff and these are the, the they're tripping themselves up and this is where it all comes from. I totally see that. But that's also the weakness because 
you need to write the show from the perspective of what if somebody has no Star Trek knowledge and this is their first introduction to Star Trek, there needs to be some kind of level of acknowledgement of what you're talking about. So I agree yeah. with you to a point, but what I really liked about that Dr. Flox part, and just to call it the actor, his name is um, John Billingsley that plays Dr. Flox. He's mm -hmm. one of my favorite characters on the show. I think he's one of the best actors on the show. His performances mm -hmm. are so nuanced. And that scene where he says he almost died, he basically says, I committed malpractice, is basically what he's saying. You yeah. can see that he is just, he is ravaged. He is guilt ridden yeah. because this simple mistake may have killed a man and he's, his whole point is to save people. Yeah. But it made sense to me because when he explained why it happened, he talked about how the curse, when they looked at it, it was that, that, that what was called treptoline or mm -hmm. whatever it was. Yeah. Uh, he said there was an extra ion or something like that to it that yeah. he didn't see. And he yeah. goes, and that caused a reaction in his body that caused this to happen. It's like, to me, that was believable because that's medicine. It's like doctors make assumptions all the time. They mm -hmm. see something like, oh, I know what that thing is. Here's how we do this. He'll be fine. And right. it's like, you don't go do the extra tests because that would just be invasive and, and a waste of time and energy. So why do it? Because it's just this thing over here. Mm -hmm. And like, doc like watching the show House, it's like, that's every episode of House. They make assumptions. They do something. And then it's like, oh my God, he's still dying. And it's like, and they do something else. So it's like, to me, it was not an issue at all that scene happened. It was gut-wrenching. And I thought his performance of how the doctor reacted to that so viscerally, and it was such a subtle performance. It was mm -hmm. like, I got a little choked up of like, oh, flocks. It's like, you could yeah. totally see, you could totally understand without even saying it, he will never make that mistake again. Yeah. And that's part of why I didn't think it needed to be said, because here's this guy basically saying, I'm so sorry, Captain. I really screwed up. He might die. And you right. can tell he will never, ever do that again. And then the archer standing in the doorway as he's leaving turns around and looks at him. And you can tell Archer is pissed. Like he yeah. is angry and then decides to let it go because he right. sees that Phlox is like flogging himself and he doesn't have to flog him further. And so yeah. he kind of like walks out the door. So for me, I think it was said. It was said in the performances between the two of them. So that's part of why I disagree with you. Right. I think that I would be more on your side of this if there had been one more line of dialogue from Archer in that moment. Maybe not so on the nose as what I described before of please make some protocol so we don't make these mistakes again. In that moment, as you've just reminded me, Archer looks back. That would have been the moment for Archer to say, you're not the only one who's made mistakes this day. If he had said that... It forgives a lot of the crimes of the earlier part. I totally agree with you. It's like that would have made, because he would have acknowledged his mistakes in this entire adventure. And Again, yes. they're right. laying the groundwork for the protocols that we're accustomed to as viewers. And that's a moment where Archer could have owned up to, yeah, you almost killed one man. Agreed. Archer's almost killed four people from his crew. <laughs> this episode, and it, he does not face the music on that. He no. does not face the music. He, uh, Bacula does a good job of depicting his anxiety and his guilt in trying to get to the crew. He's piloting the ship back to the planet to try and get to them. But there's not a moment where he's just like, I literally almost killed like my three crew. of yeah. my main crew. The away, the away crew. Yep. Yeah. So now that Flox knows what it is that's causing the problem, he's able to create an antidote and Reed is able to use the transporter to beam the antidote down to the cave. However, the problem now is that Tucker uh, Mayweather is completely incapacitated. They have a nice scene where he's looking at Tucker who is trying to tell him like it's just you and me against evil and Mayweather is looking at him with a woozy cam because he's now Mayweather is the, the technical term is tripping balls. Uh, he <laughs> yeah. is completely incapacitated as is Cutler who is passed out. Yeah. And Tucker is convinced that to Paul is now exhibiting, um, that she's effectively revealed a Vulcan plot to destroy enterprise so that the Vulcans can claim with the the death of the enterprise crew that humanity is not ready to go into space yep i really liked the tension 
of this moment. It reminded me of in the abyss, uh, Michael Bean's character yeah, who goes who's a Navy seal suffering from nitrogen poisoning. Yeah. And he's doing everything like cutting his arm under the table to release some of the extra gases. He knows that he's suffering from this thing, but it causes the psychosis that is a symptom of it. And he goes full conspiracy theory that he's uh, got to destroy everything with an atomic warhead. This is a similar moment. And I think it's well acted. I like, I like how trip builds to the moments Mm -hmm. of it's a logical progression. He makes an argument that if you don't know who these characters are, if you're just completely dropped into that scene, you can believe he's it. making an argument that makes a lot of sense if you believe in nefarious motives on the part of the Vulcans. Mm-hmm. And again, the scene is shot in ways that creates a added tension to the anxiety and the paranoia and it makes you feel like you don't know exactly what's going to happen he's holding a phaser to her she's got a phaser back she's only speaking in vulcan that's pushing him even further yeah it's it's a really nice touch the fact that he's so angry about the fact that she's speaking in vulcan um and then they and he work sh- and he's on, shooting random places in the cave when he sees the rock people popping out because it's he's like seeing he yeah is, he's seeing, he he's seeing images nut. of rock people coming out and then aboard the ship uh sato is helping archer communicate with T'Pol in vulcan to lay out a play acting moment of effectively creating a fake story that will double down on trip's paranoia convince him that this is all the rock people are real that they understand uh what's going on that T'Pol can speak to them in vulcan and that once she's communicated their reason for being on the planet they can decide whether or not the humans are in danger and it will diffuse the situation and it has a nice moment of archer reminding trip about an experience that they had in the past where trip had to trust archer and this is another uh, this is another thing that star trek has always been very good at is hearkening to a past between characters Mm -hmm. that you don't see we're never shown an earlier scene this episode didn't start with a flashback of five years earlier Mm -hmm. It didn't need to because in that moment, one of the things that Star Trek has always had going for it versus Star Wars is it's always described as the, the talkier of the sci-fis. Yep. This is one of those aspects where the captain gets to tell us as opposed to showing us like, Hey, remember you and I were in that moment and you had to trust me. You believe something was true. It wasn't. And you believed me when I told you it wasn't, you need to do that now. They effectively diffuse the situation and they're able to get uh, to everybody after the the storm passes and everybody's going to be okay. And the experience, they they show uh, a couple of of moments where the people coming out of the effects of the pollen really don't remember in detail what happened. It's it's depicted as having almost a dreamlike quality for them. So they don't really recall the details of it. And again, this is the moment where I wish Archer had owned up to something because everybody else is having the experience of like, whoo, we got through that. I wanted there to be one moment of Archer saying like, I caused that. Yeah. And that didn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit of the begin, the very beginning and the very end. It's a little bit of a letdown, but so it's about two thirds of the episode. I thought were really top notch and kind of for me made up for the negatives of the setup and the very end conclusion yeah, I, it was, it was I agree enjoyable. with you i think yeah. i think on the whole this episode stood up and had a lot of great moments yeah and and put through the scene between trip and to paul really put the tension between the humans and the vulcans on full display mm-hmm. like it mm-hmm. pulled back a lot of layers of repression on the human side of like what you people have done to us and and made it a a very tense moment for my deeper dive i wanted to to point out that i give a lot of the credit for this episode to david livingston who was the director and he he is part of star trek royalty he served as a supervising producer on star trek next generation he was also the same on deep space nine and voyager He has directorial credits on two Next Generation episodes, 17 Deep Space Nine episodes, 28 Voyager episodes, and 14 Enterprise episodes, totaling 62. He also has writing credits on Deep Space Nine 
and he's been described as knowing how to capture the moments. Um, in 1994, Livingston was nominated along with the rest of the production staff for an Emmy for Outstanding Drama Series for Next Generation. And in the pantheon of his place in the history of the Star Trek universe, a lionfish in Jean-Luc Picard's aquarium in his ready room was named Livingston. <laughs> and on the Enterprise uh, plaque, his name appears as a vice admiral. So, and it, his name appeared on plaques of the USS Enterprise D, the USS Defiant, the USS Pasteur, and the USS Sao Paulo, and the USS Voyager. So he was clearly known at the time as like, He's one of our guys. And he's a name that I wasn't aware of. So it's kind of like, he's kind of like an unsung hero in the background of yeah. Star Trek over the past 30 years, yeah. which is pretty cool. Yeah. And he clearly has his chops because like I said, this episode, by the end of it, things were really hitting great mm -hmm. moments of like, this is, this is good storytelling from a director's, yep. from a director. I also wanted in this deeper dive to give a sad t uh, tip of the hat to Kelly Waymeyer, who played Crewman Cutler. She was a face when the episode started, and she's one of the first people you see in this episode. I thought, like, I know I've seen her mm -hmm. in more things. What is, you know, what is her filmography? So I looked her up. She, when she was hired to play crewman cutler she was told this might be a recurring character that's another great thing that star trek does you end up with people like miles o'brien mm -hmm. you know who recurring character just standing in that transporter room just waiting for people to want to go somewhere and then years later becomes a regular on deep space nine and is one of my favorite characters in star trek so here's a character who i think that uh they were giving this actress an opportunity to play that kind of character who might be used. And she did end up appearing in several more episodes of enterprise. But sadly I discovered that she died two years after this episode was made and she died of a heart condition that she'd been diagnosed with as a hmm. teenager. She was in her mid thirties. So and I just thought that was very sad because I think based on this episode now as the first one we've seen her and we're going to see her a couple more times, but I really liked her. She's, yeah. She was an actress who I thought was fit the role, did a good job with it. And if you look at her filmography, um, she was getting work. And mm -hmm. so it seemed like she was building a career. And I just think it's sad that she, that she passed away so young. So that's it for this episode of Backtracking. The next time you hear from us, we'll be talking about the next episode of Enterprise, which is titled unexpected matt do you have any <laughs> forecast as to what might be happening i think it's going to probably be a story we're not going to expect mm, you might be right mm. please let us know if you have any things to weigh in on this episode what were your thoughts about the directing did you also like us think that it conveyed a sense of the paranoia and anxiety of the crewman lost on the planet you can let us know what you think in the comments and we'll talk to you next time mm -hmm.